Volunteer Forum. Uh, we're coming to you tonight uh, from Burwood, so Eight Lakeside Drive. In fact, we're coming from the uh, State Control Centre, the redundancy site. We're here in the planning room, uh, joined by a panel this evening to talk about uh, some very serious subjects, but also uh, to celebrate some of the achievements of our people. But before we kick off with tonight's agenda, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the Aboriginal lands which we're all meeting on tonight and celebrate and pay my respect to Aboriginal elders past and present and recognise the strength and resilience of Aboriginal people in this land. As always, I'm uh, joined tonight by an esteemed panel uh, and we have uh, Peter Shaw, uh, Group Officer for Knox, but uh, you're also a board member uh, for the CFA. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Of course, a lady that needs no introduction, our CEO, Natalie McDonald. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you. Good to And uh, Dawn Hartog, uh, Captain Extraordinaire, uh, Deputy G DGO as well, I believe, and a board member as well. Welcome, Thanks. Dawn. Thank you. And Alex Batty, Commander Alex Batty, so District 14, uh, command, Catchment Commander for the Mount Cottrell Group. Welcome, Alex. Thanks a pleasure much. to have you on uh, the panel this evening and waiting uh, in the wings, ready to answer <laughs> any of the difficult questions that the panel can't answer is our ge uh, Group General Manager, Kylie Bates, for uh, Support Services, who uh, will be joining us to uh, contribute to tonight's discussion as well. As always, tell us where you're from. We're always interested to know where our members are, are watching from, uh, contributing to uh, the volunteer forum. So please, there's a chat function that you are able to access. Tell us where you're from. And likewise, if you have a question, uh, any question whatsoever, as you know, we like the hard ones here on the, on the forum, uh, about tonight's subject material or any other matter, uh, there are other CFA executives and senior management online uh, waiting to answer those questions for you. And as usual, any question that we can't answer, uh, we will uh, endeavour to take on notice and get those answers back out uh, to you. Uh, tonight we have a quite a, an interesting agenda. Uh, we are going to be talking about some very serious issues uh, and some issues that uh, for some of our members may likely to cause some distress. At this point, I'd like to point out that there are uh, the assistance of, of uh, our member services, our member wellbeing services. Uh, so if you do feel uncomfortable at any stage throughout this evening, please, uh, it is okay to uh, have a chat to someone, seek some assistance. Uh, it's a very vital and important subject we need to talk about tonight, but for some, we appreciate it will be challenging uh, to hear and listen to what we've got to discuss. But before we get on to uh, that topic, what I do want to do uh, is to acknowledge some fantastic individuals uh, in the CFA. Uh, recently, uh, we had the Queen's birthday long weekend. Yes, it is just more than a public holiday, folks. Uh, it's a day where we acknowledge the fantastic achievement of many Australians. And uh, CFA was no different with four fantastic members. Uh, we had Deborah Luke, uh, Alastair Drayton, John Cohen and Richard Crom, who were recognised with the Australian Fire Service Medal. So congratulations to all those individuals, those well-deserving individuals. And it's, it's about time that we pay uh, some homage to those uh, for, and recognise uh, the uh, achievements that they have. Dawn, uh, you are the chair of the Honours and Awards Committee for the board. Um, yeah. So uh, these four nominations came through uh, the committee. Uh, give they us did. your reflection on, I guess, why it's important we recognise our members. Absolutely. Um, it's actually quite a privilege to chair the Honours, Awards and Remembrance Committee. Um, and amongst that, we uh, clearly, one of our main features and, and responsibilities is the um, selection and the support of of many, many members across the state on um, celebrating and recognising their achievements. So um, it's an absolute honour and privilege to see names such as those that you just saw on your screen there who come before us, getting to actually read the history, reading their achievements, their contributions um, far and wide over many years, um, but also quite um, uh, quite saturated in some points too, that you know their effect on their communities mm. and, and the sector have just been incredible. We're always looking for more. We want Absolutely. more. <laughs> and I see Deborah's name there. And I understand CFAE uh, got its first female AFSM uh, only in 2008. That's correct. And, you know, it, it certainly, so we've got a long way to go. Uh, and we do. I guess you've got a bit of a message for people out there. <laughs> I do. Um, so whilst I want to recognise every single member um, 
and the contributions that they provide, we know that we are significantly underrepresented in um, women across this amazing organization. And I know for a fact um, that there are some truly, truly inspirational and truly um, worthy and deserving um, women members out there that I would love to see those names come across to the committee. So um, I would say get out there, support them, pop in those applications because we're ready for them. Excellent. And Peter, you, you're also on the uh, Honours and Awards and Remembrance I am, yes. Committee with, with Dawn and myself. Yeah. Um, what's your take? Why is it so important that the board recognise the achievement of our members? Look, it's a lot of our people talk about the fact that they don't necessarily need or want recognition. They're there to do the service to the community, to the state. Um, but it's nice to be able to give some sort of recognition to those pe people that put in that extra time, the extra work that they do across the, mm -hmm. the organisation. It's not just centred on local areas necessarily, but across the organisation. And it's just great to be able to recognise that. Oh, awesome. Uh, Alex, you're on the front line, mate. I am. On the ground. Um, when you know, members get recognised in such a way, and it's not just AFSMs, you know, yeah. it's Outstanding mm -hmm. Service Medals, it's other, you know, other award types. Uh, what does, I guess, yeah, what does it do for morale? What does it do for the brigades uh, out in the field? Absolutely. Look, you know what, recognition in this sort of form is so important. And I think um, in particular, some of the the uh, uh, award winners from this round, they're people that have gone unspoken in the past. And I think any way that we can uh, recognise people for the contribution that they're making over such a long period of time is extremely important. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, Dawn Peter, it's fair to say one of the biggest uh, challenges and frustrations we have as, as members of that committee is uh, probably the lack of nominations. Um, Absolutely. Lack yes. of female nominations, but yes. more broadly the lack of nominations. Yes. And um, I guess what, what what can we do? And uh, Alex, from your perspective, I guess, you know, what's your advice uh, in terms of, you know, trying to encourage people to, if they see something or they know something that's happened, that, yeah. you know, you know what, that person's really deserving of something special. H how do you, how can members go about bringing that to our attention? You're spot on, and we don't do enough of it. Mm. Um, I really encourage people to get out there, have a look at the awards um, uh, uh, program online, mm -hmm. uh, get in touch with your catchment commander, get in touch with your district, put people forward. There's a whole range of ways that we can recognise people. And uh, we need to do it. Yeah, um, Natalie, it's not all tanks, bombs, and airplanes. That's yeah, right. there are. There is a, a whole other part of CFA. Mm. Um, we do the wards system is actually open to all our members, whether they be operational, non-operational, um, yeah, you know, salaried or, or volunteer. How important is it to to recognise you know, our our administration staff and management? Oh, well, it's, it's absolutely critical. I think the, probably the first thing to say is that um, around 40% of our administrative staff are also volunteers. Mm. So there's a real crossover. And I think if there's one message probably coming out of tonight on a number of fronts, it's that we are all CFA. Mm. It takes um, a broad church to do, the, um, to do the work of CFA. It takes the support. It takes the volunteers, it takes the operational um, expertise and skill as well. And it's pretty critical that we recognise that as a whole. I think there is more to be done in terms of recognising some of the work that our um, administrative and um, professional staff do. And it is something we'll be looking at over the next, um, next period of time. But in the meantime, the opportunity to take advantage of the award system that we do have, and I know you're all looking at how we pull that together and make that more coherent, um, but to recognise the work that everyone in CFA does, no matter what their role, um, no matter what their employment relationship um, is, is, is really important as we move forward. It's, it's um, phenomenal, the work of the people of CFA and the opportunities to recognise that are there. Mm. It's now how we take advantage of that. Absolutely. We've got some really hard working and dedicated men and women employed by the CFA right across this state. So uh, if you do know someone from the, from the district office or whatever that want to recognise, uh, absolutely uh, put, that, put that forward. Uh, Peter, your thoughts? I, yeah, I just wanted to put forward, in my district we just recently ran a uh, awards and uh, uh, how to uh, initiate awards. And we ran a program at the district that involved every brigade in the district, where we had uh, Belinda Gillespie from the Honours and Awards Office come along and do a presentation. And it was about how to go about submitting awards mm. uh, recognition uh, programs. Yep. And we, I think we got pretty good feedback. I think we had most, if not all, of the brigades from the district involved and it gave them a heads up and an insight. And I'd recommend that to any other district to, uh, mm. to look at how to present, not the awards themselves, but how to present the work to put into 
asking for the awards or seeking recognition. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. So, uh, as I said, if, if you do know a deserving CFA member that you want to see recognised, uh, information on how to uh, nominate people for these awards is available on members online, or you can talk to, uh, to your district office for, for further assistance. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to, I guess, a more serious topic uh, and why we have come uh, together this evening. And this is to talk about uh, in detail and answer your questions in relation to a recently released report from the CFA, uh, our independent review into culture and issues management here. And uh, what we propose to do now is take you through uh, why we did the independent review, uh, some of the key outcomes and recommendations uh, of that review and the roadmap uh, to what to, we have the report now, it's the, that's the what and then it's the, the so what uh, in, in moving forward uh, as part of uh, that process. So we do have a bit of a slide presentation so we'll kick that off and we'll, we'll guide you through it. Uh, as I said, uh, we did put the member welfare and assistance number in the chat. Uh, we will be talking about some difficult subjects this evening. Uh, if you do need uh, some assistance, please feel free to reach out or uh, step away from the computer uh, for a while. Um, so why did the CFA undertake this cultural review? Why, why was it necessary? Uh, we're working to create a more agile, uh, positive and transparent culture. And I think it's pretty clear uh, by some of the communications that both Natalie and myself have been putting out that uh, we're working very hard to ensure a, 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 new, a renewed CFA and an era of transparency uh, and a culture that uh, is, is positive. Um, we do recognise and experience that a lot of work has been done over the last 18 months. And we've heard from you, our members, uh, that the experiences that some have had in respect to our complaints processes, how we deal with complaints and issues management, has not been uh, the best uh, in, in the past. And that's why we've commissioned this forward-looking independent review to examine the culture, to examine the issues, uh, and looking at our organisational approaches to promoting diversity and dealing with uh, issues of, uh, of the past. Any CEO of a large corporation will tell you to change a culture in an organisation takes time. It is a journey. Uh, it's like turning the Titanic around. Probably a poor choice of words there. Uh, let's the QE2 perhaps. Um, but it, you know, to turn a large ship around, uh, it takes time. Uh, and changing a culture of an organisation takes time. Time. And that's one of the things that we do need to put through, but we need to be working on that every day. From the outset, uh, can I say, we are deeply sorry for any member, current or past, who has experienced harm or issues uh, in the CFA through our complaints management process or having those issues brought to us uh, in the past. And we sincerely hope uh, by doing this report and hearing the voices of those individuals goes a long way to healing the past uh, but more importantly, unlocking a future to move forward for the organisation more broadly and the important people that make that up. I might ask our, our CEO, Natalie McDonald, now to, to step us through uh, some of the key themes and highlights from that report um, and really talk about what that means. But before I do, uh, as I did say, that the, the report is enshrined with the voices of our members, the experience of our members as it was told by them in their voice. And one of the, the other thing I just wanted to point out that one of the review, the review team uh, in the engagement of to undertake that was not commissioned with investigating the veracity uh, or the, 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 the facts around or even to substantiate those experiences. We, it was important that we captured how people felt and how people are engaged uh, with the service. So when you do read uh, those comments, when you do read those experiences, uh, it's not about whether they did or didn't happen. It's not about whether um, you know, it was confirmed. It was about recognising that they were the experiences of our members and that's important to, to keep in the back of, uh, back of your mind. The full report, uh, all uh, 255 pages, uh, is available on Members Online, but uh, if you didn't want to read the full report, and I can forgive you for not wanting to read such a, a volume, uh, there is a, a really good 20-page summary report. Uh, if any of our members don't do anything at all, I'd really encourage you to read the summary report. It is a, a great snapshot of the hard work that, um, that Helen's Oak and crew uh, have done. Natalie, did you want to take us through uh, some of the key themes and recommendations from the report? Thanks, um, Jason, for that. And, you know, I do want to um, start out before we get right into that is, is recognising that 
you know, the CFA is a very large organisation and we are all part of it, um, some 55,000 members. And while it was, it was very sobering and distressing to read some of the experiences people have had, um, it is important to remember that the vast majority of our members are absolutely, um, you know, um, working in line with community expectations and the values of the CFA. So I think it is important to recognise that and acknowledge that. But it's also important to recognise and acknowledge that some people's experiences have not been good. And, um, and that's not something we want to see going forward. And there is a journey for the CFA to work through. One of the positive things about um, this report, uh, firstly, that we commissioned. So it was something that in listening to members, we wanted to understand what else the CFA can do to provide a positive um, and productive working environment, whatever your role is, and, um, and to make it a positive experience for all. So the report actually gives us 10 recommendations, and I'm not going to go through them in detail. I will summarise them here this evening. Um, but they are all doable, achievable, implementable recommendations that will take us forward. So not looking backwards, but take us forward to provide um, a stronger CFA. And, and it's really... Um, an important message, I think. There's a lot of positives in the report about how we can move forward. Media doesn't always pick up on the positives, we know that, but it is important, I think, that we recognise the, the positives there. It's also pleasing that the CFA board, and I'm sure Dawn and Peter will talk about this shortly, um, recognised and accepted the 10 recommendations in full, which is uh, fantastic. The CFA... Um, is on a journey. These things, as Jason said, take time and, and we'll be spending some time over the next uh, couple of months working through which things we can do quickly, which things will take longer. And every single one of us has a role to play in addressing some of the, um, some of the things that the report found. So we look forward to working with you all. Now, I'll just quickly go through a, kind of a summary of the recommendations. As Jason said, they are in a 20-page summary, which doesn't sound like a summary, but it is off a 200-page report. Um, so the first set of recommendations are relating to the way the CFA establishes expectations of behaviours and, um, and relate to things like building the implementation plan for the five-year period and, importantly and critically, and this is a fundamental building block, um, really enforcing at every opportunity the values and standards of the CFA. And that's why we've um, talked in the past in forums about the behavioural standards. You'll hear us talk about this a lot, lot more. Um, we will be looking to embed those behavioural standards in everything we do. The second set of themes uh, relate to the way CFA supports leaders at all levels of the organisation to set the expectations and then manage any issues that come out of um, things not going as well as they could. So this is really about looking and reviewing the way CFA provides support to our ACFOs, our commanders, our brigade management teams, our group management teams, our group officers, just taking a step back and saying, what are the supports we're providing and how can we uh, make that more effective and efficient to ensure that people have the tools and the skills they need to manage in what is a very complex and large organisation. The third theme relates to the way the CFA manages complaints, grievances and issues and escalation paths. And there's quite a lot in these recommendations. And while there has been a bit of, you know, a fair bit of work done in the last 18 months, there's still a lot more to do. So these recommendations point to the things we need to do to continue to improve the issues management, um, to increase avenues for conflict resolution all the way through the organisation, and to continue to improve the focus on health and wellbeing and opportunities for resilience and supporting people um, to work through issues as they arrive, arise. Sorry. The next um, set of themes are in, our, in relation to our overall culture supporting diversity. We've talked about this before in these forums. You'll hear us talk about it again. Um, it is important for the future of the CFA that we increase our capacity for diversity and inclusion across all levels. This is about ensuring that we've got volunteers from all walks of life who can support their communities and our communities and that volunteers from any background 
um, feel welcome in the CFA and are able to participate to their full capacity. So um, there's been a lot of work done across the organisation over a period of time. Our diversity and inclusion councils are real champions of this work and it's um, their role will be critical, but everybody has a role to play again in, in increasing diversity and inclusion at CFA. The next um, measure in here is around measuring cultural change. So how do we hold all of ourselves accountable? What are the measures that we use to assess how we're tracking against um, this, these objectives in the, next, in the next five years? So there'll be, again, some work that we'll be doing on that. We already have some good measurement tools, things like the VFBV survey, um, welfare and efficiency survey is a really valuable tool that we use. Um, we know it's not used everywhere, but um, encourage people to, to give us feedback on that. But there'll be other measures that we'll be looking at all through all layers of the organisation to see how we're tracking. Uh, the ne and the last set of themes is in relation to um, productivity and innovation. So. Importantly, uh, everybody here knows we're part of an, uh, a system of emergency service provision and fire service provision in, in Victoria. We've got FFM Vic, we've got um, EMV, we've got FRV, um, and we've got our colleagues in SES, a number of other agencies that we work with. And so the report is encouraging us and urging us to work in collaboration with a number of those agencies to ensure that we're maximising the benefit of things like joint training, <coughs> resolution of issues, working things through. And finally, um, ensuring that the CFA, as we move forward, is able to invest in resource management systems that support our people in, um, in managing. So I think you'll agree, Jason, it's a pretty comprehensive mm. set of recommendations. Um, it is a blueprint for CFA for the next five years at least. Um, to allow us to work through and our intention is to be uh, developing the implementation plan over the next couple of months and we will be publicly reporting against that plan as we move forward so that we can all assess how we're tracking and, um, and where we're headed with these things. It will take time. We've had some great initiatives in place already things like our Women's Advisory Group, our Young Adults Advisory Group, the behavioural standards I've already mentioned, um, and some of the diversity and inclusion activities. Um, but that's not enough. There's more to be done. And, um, and I think we're all looking forward to rolling our sleeves up, working all of us, every one of us, to try and create the CFA that, um, that we really want to see in our communities, in our districts, in our state. Um, so, uh, Jason, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm sure there's lots of questions and you've probably got plenty as yeah. well. Um, but uh, that's a very quick run through, but encourage everybody yeah. to, read, to read the report and uh, the summary at the least and, um, and get engaged with this. Yeah. Uh, I think that my first question, I guess, is, and, and as many would know, I, I did a bit of media on, uh, on, on this topic and uh, was probably grilled by the best uh, and shout out to, to those journalists. But uh, it was one in particular question that, that was asked to me was, you know, read, looking at the recommendations, uh, it was put to me that it was a lot of corporate speak. Um, and it was very, uh, you know, holistic, wrapped up corporate speak. Um, there are more to the recommendations, aren't there, in the full report? Like, uh, you, these have been packaged up nicely in terms of mm. themes and the recommendations itself. Uh, but tell us more about if you were to go to the full report, um, there's further details underneath each of those recommendations, isn't there? Yeah, they're very specific. Um, so we, we really are using those high level um, sentences, if you like, as, as themes. And, um, but when you actually go to the report and the actual recommendations, they're very specific. Mm. There's very specific things that are being identified that we need to work on. Um, and, and that's what we will do. Absolutely. So at this point, I might um, throw to you, uh, Dawn and Peter, uh, board members. Um, yeah, you've been with the board for, for some time. And obviously, uh, you're part of the, the journey to A, approve uh, you see if, you know, the executive undertaking this review uh, and then obviously receiving the report and reading it. Um, first thoughts? Uh, first thoughts, I was really quite proud of the organisation and the authority for having gone down this track to um, knowing that it, it was going to be everything. It was going to be the good, the bad and the ugly. But the appetite from the board and from the executive and from the leadership across the state is that we actually want to move forward and we want to address these and we actually want to make this um, organisation one that you 
not only want to work at, but that you want to volunteer for years and years and years. So I was very proud of the fact that we embarked on this journey. What we got out, you know, and, and what the feedback was, largely, you know, we, um, you know, the, there were some things that were very surprising and distressing, as Natalie said, but there was also stuff that we know from those of us that are out on the ground, um, you know, that these are issues. So now the fact that we're actually going to embrace that and we've already seen that through some of the things that Natalie's talking, you know, that's spoken about um, is really great to see that we already have had the positive and we already are actually attending to issues and attending to progressing things already before actually um, this kind of hitting the page. Um, Peter, uh, board member but also group officer and a brigade member and you know, been part of CFA for quite a considerable amount of time. A couple of years, yeah. <laughs> it's just a few years. Um, did any of this report surprise you? I wouldn't say it surprised me, no. Um, I certainly get feedback at local level about issues. Um, sometimes I get asked if I can help resolve them and where you can, you do. But uh, no, there was nothing surprising in the report as such. I think it just outlaid uh, uh, just the background of people's concerns over many, many years. Um, what I do see out of it in particular, though, that I'll probably mention is the fact that there was a previous report that we couldn't release, and the board was certainly driven by the fact that we still needed to do something mm. Mm. to get some of this out there to our people and to start looking at planning at how we move forward from here. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we pushed as a board to get this report up and running and get it going. And for the people at home, uh, the report that <laughs> Peter refers to is, is the Veriok report yep. uh, conducted back in, in 2015 that obviously is subject to a court suppression order. So, uh, yeah, we haven't been able to, to see that report or talk about it. Um, but Natalie, I know it is a question that you and I get asked mm. oh, so many times, uh, both in the volunteer and staff context. Um, what's your thoughts around, because I, I believe that we can move forward without the Veriok report. What's your thoughts to to why that is the case and why this report now is so important. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I, I think it's not that we can, it's that we must. They're very um, true. We can't yeah. keep looking backwards. We have to look forward. And that is one of the um, things that we really wanted to do with this report is get that forward-looking agenda and the steps that we, practical steps that we need to take as an organisation to move ourselves forward. I think it, it, I'm hoping that for people it does put some of the very op pain to bed. Um, it, it has allowed people across the CFA to tell their stories and that was important to people. We heard the feedback that people um, had, some people had felt robbed of the opportunity um, to have their stories heard. I hope that this has gone some way um, to supporting that. Um, and importantly, out of those stories being told, um, the identification of key things that we can work on at every level, at brigade, um, at crew, at, at group. Um, there are many things that all of us can do every day um, to try and um, support a more productive mm. culture. And my impression is that people want that mm -hmm. opportunity to move forward. Absolutely. I uh, have some, some questions flowing in as, as we would expect. You know, it's quite a uh, a passionate subject for our people and um, the first one uh, Mr Bishop talks about the need for change and the introduction of transparency uh, and his I guess experience is obviously uh, is that feedback is not is not given to the complaint and I guess that goes to recommendation four mm -hmm. which is about that continuing to improve the process for, for issues management um, what I guess in your reading of the report what's what's the direction uh, that you'd be thinking we'd be heading in respect to recommendation four? Yeah, so there's definitely um, feedback for um, all of us at CFA on um, next steps around improving uh, complaints management and issues management. There has been a lot done, um, but there's more to do. Mm. There's no question about that. Uh, and certainly one of the recommendations um, ter it turns its mind to the issue about providing feedback generally so that people do understand what action has been taken in relation to their complaint. It's always difficult in organisations because that has to be balanced with people's um, rights in, in all sorts of ways. Um, but I think we have to listen to that recommendation and, and look at ways that we can, we can um, improve that. One of the reasons that the board and um, your, yourself and myself, Jason, were so determined to release the report in its entirety, as is, warts and all, is in support of that transparency agenda. Um, and we, we take a few hits when we do that, right? We, we, we put it out and we take hits, but 
that's the price we pay for getting greater transparency um, and pushing on with improving the CFA. Mm. And, and many would say that's, uh, that's the price of leadership sometimes, yep. isn't it? Being brave, mm. putting yourself out there and, and taking, mm. taking the hits. And uh, certainly, um, yeah, we're very committed. All the executive at CFA is very committed uh, to ensuring that this report and comes to fruition through an implementation plan. Uh, Eric Collier, thank you uh, for, for your views and thoughts there. Uh, it's greatly appreciated and uh, I'm glad that uh, for you, uh, it has uh, you know, uh, shone through with uh, uh, how CFA is moving, uh, is moving forward. So thank you very much for your comments there. Uh, Roger asks a really great question. And I, might, uh, I might throw this one to, to, to yourself, Dawn. Um, and it basically uh, asks, um, yeah, it's great the recommendations and CFAs welcome the adoption of the full report, uh, including the board. Um, but what does success look like? Oh, great question. How long have we got, Roger? How long have we got, everyone? <laughs> um, look, I think success looks like, and it's not going to happen overnight, and I, I just want to reiterate, I think, what um, Natalie said before, but I think success actually, um, you're looking at it tonight, so it's actually having this discussion, that's where it starts. And then as the months and the years go on, it looks like a CFA that does actually represent the community, that does have that representation across the genders, across um, the populations. It actually has, when we're doing these, which, you know, we'll, we'll have the, um, you know, we've got that regular survey function and we've got the regular kind of evaluation functions. We actually start to see the good outweigh the bad or the positives outweigh the negatives. But I think it also actually, um, what it looks like is uh, an authority and an organisation that reflects the desires of everyone from the end of a hose on the ground through to groups, through to um, the different you know directorates, mm. um, through to the board. Absolutely. Um, Alex, what's your thoughts on, I guess, the report, uh, what CFA is trying to do? Because, you know, to be frank, you're at the point end. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're with the brigades. Yep. You're dealing with brigades and BMTs and GMTs when things don't go right, you know, quite often the command is the first call. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, first, I think it's a really important piece of work. I, I think um, in all, we've probably seen uh, people be a little bit tired in the past. There's a bit of fatigue around this space. But in the conversations that I'm having with people, they're actually really hungry for change. And, and I think uh, in reading through certainly the summary of the report and recommendations, which shows some really good strategic uh, goals for us to hit, uh, in all, providing people with the resources that they need to actually create that cultural change is what's identified in this report, and I think that's what's really needed. Mm. So as a, as a catchment commander, what, do you, what would you say in this space would be your biggest challenges? It's, it's the low-level uh, complaints, I think, and, and I think whether there have been those that have been festering perhaps over the last two years where people haven't been away, but it's, mm. it's the human nature stuff. It's about um, sitting down and having conversations with people, and it's tough, right? This, these can be tough conversations. Mm. So, so I think if we can get to a space where we actually are able to do some of that stuff back again and give people the skill set, give people the tools to do that, I know it'll certainly help me, but I know it's going to make people are much more confident to have those conversations back in their own brigades or groups as well. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. Uh, Natalie, yep. will we be doing our homework and marking it too? Uh, no, <laughs> um, you know, we'll, uh, we, we might form preliminary views ourselves, but um, we have uh, committed and it is in fact one of the recommendations and given that we've accepted all recommendations, we commit again. Um, we will be having progress against the implementation plan independently reviewed through the course of the five years so that it's not just us saying, trust us, it's all under control. Um, so we will actually be looking at that independent reassessment of how we're going against the recommendations. And I just see Roger's um, question there again coming back to um, how we're going to measure it. The answer is there are multiple ways to measure it. We have, we have for example, um, survey uh, that we do annually with our staff. It reflects some of the interactions between staff and um, the organisation. As I said, we've got the survey. Uh, the Volunteer um, uh, Welfare and Efficiency mm -hmm. Survey. We've got range of, a range of measures um, and we will be looking at things um, like the uh, Section 29s and some mm -hmm. of those things to see whether we can pick up more cultural information through those. 
Um, and we'll also be looking at other mechanisms that we may be able to use. I got approached yesterday, for example, um, from a university who said we've got a you know free PhD student. I don't know whether the PhD student knows if they're free or not. But, um, we'll deal with that in due course. Who's very interested in the measurement of cultural change and would like to work with CFA. So there will be a range of measures, Roger, and we will be um, putting those, once we work those through as part of the implementation plan, we will be putting those on members online and it will be available for people to see how we're tracking. Um, ben, ben, uh, Brendan uh, raises a really good issue here. Uh, so first theme, develop and implement a five-year plan. How will the volunteer voice be enshrined in that plan moving forward? Well, do we want to ask our volunteers? Well, that's probably a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will be. It will be. <laughs> Depends yeah. on if you're asking the outgoing um, vocal anyway, volunteer, <laughs> or, or if you're, you're uh, wondering generally across. Um, I think the only way to do that is actually in, instead of, you know, and, and a lot of organisations I think, not only, they're not necessarily guilty of this, but they can be, but I think there's an assumption that they do all the planning and all the discussions in, in one building, in one part of, of Melbourne or one part of Victoria. And I think the onus is on those conversations actually going to that ground level. So actually at the group meetings, um, at the brigade meetings. So you're actually out there, um, not just relying on surveys, Surveys are great. Electronic surveys are really good, but that in um, you know in-person opportunity. Um, as much as I know that we can't clone um, 50 each of you, Jason, or 50 each of you, um, Natalie. I think it is actually about on the ground and taking opportunities where those volunteer forums are already in existence and already happening. Captains' forums, you name it. And of course, we have our key stakeholder in the volunteer space, the absolutely. BFBV, yeah, uh, absolutely. who played a role in contributing uh, to, to, the, to the report. Uh, mm. And I see them playing a, a very integral role in developing the plan, um, testing the plan, sounding the plan out uh, and the like. But uh, I guess um, it's also incumbent upon all of us as leaders to be out there talking about it, you know, talking to our members, getting feedback and feeding that back into the organisation uh, as well to inform uh, those plans moving forward. So great question, uh, Ben, but I'm pretty sure you heard it here uh, from the voices of, uh, of the RFSA board directors that volunteers <laughs> will be a CFA. Jason. <laughs> oh. I've never done that on this. Um, CFA, ladies and gentlemen, my apologies. Um, the rumours are not true. Um, from members of the CFA board, mm -hmm. the volunteers will uh, be yes, involved uh, in the development of yeah. the implementation plan. And I think, Jason, just sorry if, if I can too, um, and I've said it in you know many forums, that the leadership that we talk about isn't necessarily just the leadership of the board or just the leadership of the executive. It's actually the leadership of every single one of us who are a member of CFA. And so that onus and that connection, I think we all have to actually take on ourselves to be part of this if we genuinely want to be. Absolutely. Um, so Alex, recommendation three uh, says to ensure effective support to ACFOs, commanders such yep. as yourself, uh, brigade management teams, group management teams, uh, and the like, yep. um, where would you like to see that support go? And, and from your experience, what are some of the things that CFA should start considering yep. um, to allow you to put more tools in the toolbox to, to deal with these issues? Yeah, look, I think the behavioural standards is a really good example of what mm. was something that we're about to roll out that's going to be a really mm. key uh, set of tools for people to use because it's a standard that we needed to revisit. Uh, it's, it's one that's, mm. uh, that's current. And it actually provides people with a tool to have those difficult conversations at, at the brigade level, at the group level, uh, level at the district level before they uh, move into to something that's larger. So I think um, that's particularly important. I think um, we've got a lot of work to do in the leadership space, uh, Chief, you know, in terms of being able to provide uh, people with uh, the right set of skills to make sure that they can lead people during mm. challenging times. Uh, so I'm particularly excited about that as well. Mm. Excellent, thank you. Uh, some some more great questions coming through, and I might uh, might put this one to, to yourself, Natalie. So Daniel asks, forty percent of CFA staff also CFA volunteers. Mm. Um, how will management avoid staff not using internal only information to gain one's advantage in the volunteers BMT role, causing disadvantage to an outsider vol? 
Hmm. I'm not really sure where that question's coming from, but um, I think we'd have to, you know, we'd have to kind of dig a bit, Daniel, and happy to perhaps, you know, talk about that offline. I think it's a really positive thing that our staff members are, you know, volunteers as well. It, it can sometimes create lines which people have to be careful about. As a staff member, they may have access to information that's um, information as a staff member, and it's not information that's necessarily mm. out for the brigade management team or whatever. That, that's a conflict of interest potentially that staff have to be conscious of and work through. Um, but, and I think we've got to have clearer mm. lines about those things. But on the whole, it is a very positive mm. thing um, for us to have staff working in the organisation who understand inherently the nature ethos. of volunteering yeah. and, um, yeah. and are doing it. Yeah. And, they, uh, and, and that creates a very strong link with the CFA values and the CFA um, processes that we have to think through. And I think it's a great strength of our organisation that we have that. But there are, you know, there are challenges that um, those staff who are in the position um, of both, including some of our very, very senior staff, that mm. we have to manage about how, what, what hat you're wearing at, at what point. And I'd hazard a guess to say that's also an issue for our board members as well who oh, are volunteers. Absolutely. Mm. It's, mm. Uh, there are times when I have information and know things that I can't necessarily pass on to. I'd love to at times say, this is where we're going. Mm. Um, but we can't always do that. But I'm also mindful that if you just invoke the CFA values mm. Mm. Um, and work to that, then you have some idea of where you, know, where you stand mm. and, and, and mm. pass on the information and, and information that you might get through a staff role um, and uh, use that, the values, as the, as the aim to get where, you, where you're going to take it. Because at the end of it, I guess it does boil down to you know, behavioural standards and mm. management of conflicts, really, yes. doesn't mm. it? So um, another, another heart, you know, as I said, we don't shy away from the difficult questions on this forum. Um, and again, probably one for yourself, Natalie, I'm, mm. I'm sorry. No, um, <laughs> so Peter asks, do you acknowledge the frustration being felt amongst volunteers and what happens in the immediate future for those brigades and members whilst the recommendation, whilst the recommended changes are being implemented? Yeah, look, I think there's um, frustration for volunteers, there's frustration for staff, there's frustration for leaders. Um, I think we all feel it from time to time because the rate of change isn't what we want or isn't working the way we want it to work. I do think it's important that no matter how frustrated we are, we all still deal with each other in line with the CFA values. So it's okay to be frustrated, um, but the way we work mm. those frustrations through must be in line with the values and the behavioural standards. And I think we all, all of us need to remember that from time to time. Um, we do acknowledge that it is frustrating sometimes for brigades and, and volunteers when things aren't going exactly the way they want. So. I'm up front there, um, Peter, and saying, yes, we, we acknowledge that's the case. We don't always have the money that we want to do the things we mm. need to do. We have to prioritise. We have to do those things. But all of us are here because we are CFA and we are all trying to make CFA a better place. So that's the p starting position of any conversation, I think, that we have to have in that process. Um, and if we start from that position, then we're likely to get to outcomes more quickly, I think, or I'm, I believe, anyway, that's, that's my view. I think it's also important, Peter, on that one, that um, nobody should be waiting for the miracle to occur. It's us, we, the CFA, every one of us, has a role to play in getting these things implemented that we're talking through. So. Um, it's a journey that every one of us from tomorrow or from this evening can kind of mm. start and say, OK, what, what can we do to try and work some of these issues through in a, in a better way than what we may have worked them through in the past? So it's, um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but I think it's important to kind of no, acknowledge, acknowledge that it is a journey. I think you have. And look, and Peter's asked another, mm. another difficult question. And uh, this one's probably to... Uh, actually, I'd, I'd like you to answer this one um, or give us your thoughts, I guess, mm. Alex, because uh, it probably does go to the heart of the sentiment of the feeling of the members uh, on the coalface. And yep. that's given recent controversial media reports regarding lost training records yep. and the sense there's mm. a great deal of angst between CFA districts and brigade members, what's your, I guess, thought and feeling take up to that to that matter in the training space oh, i guess that i the, yeah there's there's i guess a um uh you know a sense that i that perhaps there is a bit of a 
uh, an underlying issue occurring. Yep. Yep. Um, now, we've heard about the training records issue, but yep. I guess it goes to the heart that perhaps there is some animosity, angst, or whatever it is between brigades, districts, yep. you know, the CFA broadly. What's been your experience? Well, I think, to be quite frank, it exists. I mean, that would be the experience of the members that I talk to every day. Uh, it's a very sensitive topic. I mean, training is the linchpin of everything that we do. And I know that there's a lot of work going on in this space to try and rectify that. Um, but we've got some immediate problems that we need to deal with. And, and I think, um, leaning back to what um, Natalie was saying before about frustrations, that's probably a key piece of that. Um, and so uh, I, I think um, patience is something that we all need to have uh, in working through those issues. Uh, but I'm seeing some good things uh, happening out in the space and, and where we might be waiting for some, some packages to come on board, we're moving into doing what we used to do and, and create training for ourselves. Uh, mm. But notwithstanding, I, I think, um, Chief, the, the comments uh, that have been made are, are, are what people mm. are feeling on the ground. Mm. And, and I think the, the challenge for CFA is, and it is part of this cultural reform space, mm. is being able to have those uh, conversations together yep. um, to seek to resolve those issues you know, as soon as possible and as easy as possible, um, and working with our brigades to... Yeah, to try and deal with the issues as uh, as they arise. Yeah, that's right. You know, I think coming back to what we were saying before, it's, it's really get uh, it's really easy, I think, for all of us to get caught up in the frustrations. And, and when you're sitting down at the fire station, you're talking with people. Uh, it's very easy to make that the only thing that you talk about. But you know, there's so many good things that we're doing, whether it be in the training space or whether it be in this uh, in the reform space or, or um, this report. Um, we just need to find a little bit of time to talk about them as well. Mm. Yeah. And I think too, we actually have to stop and realise that each person and, and having the privilege of seeing the authority from three different levels, the trifecta, um, each person, whether they're a volunteer, whether they're a district staff, whether they're somebody um, at headquarters or on the board, everybody actually rocks up wanting to do the right thing by our people. And I think we need to actually stop and, and recognise that, that we are all actually trying to find those solutions. Yeah. But we do need to hear the, you know, the issues and the problems and then we can fix them. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. And making about the problem, not the person, yeah. Which, yeah. which is an experience of mine within the district. Mm. You know, th there are so many challenges, but let's make it about the problem and not the people mm. that are trying to help us work our way through them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Some wise uh, words of wisdom there from, uh, from Commander Batty. Uh, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, our, our chair, uh, Mr Greg Wilson, uh, couldn't be here with us this evening, um, but he has uh, ensured that there are two very able representatives uh, of the board. Uh, having said that, uh, Greg has prepared uh, a message and we'll just uh, play a short video message from uh, our board chair in relation to our cultural uh, review and recommendations. I'm Greg Wilson, Chair of the CFA Board. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Board to thank everyone who participated in this important review, which will help strengthen and make the CFA better into the future. I know that for some, sharing their stories as part of this review wouldn't have been easy. And I know that being part of the CFA hasn't always been a positive experience for everyone. We've been on a journey to improve and build a more positive culture for all of our members. As part of that journey in September last year, we decided to commission an external review to look at the work that we were doing, what we were proposing to do, and to make sure we had the best advice on what steps we should undertake going forward. I know that there's some work to do, but the board is confident that the guidance and recommendations from this review will enhance the work that we have underway and will help us further improve the environment for all our members so that we can ensure the CFA truly is a great place to volunteer and work for all. And there you have it, a message from uh, our board chair, Mr Greg Wilson, that uh, really does go to cement the board's absolute commitment uh, to implementing and seeing this cultural review uh, and its implementation plan being put into action uh, across a CFA. Uh, we have a new panel member with us. Uh, welcome, Kylie. Thank you, Chief. And uh, so you're the General Group Manager Support Services. That's right. And uh, we're quite involved in, in the cultural review and pulling it together. People and culture sits within your 
your Ballywick and the lead executive on pulling together the implementation plan. Where the hard work really happens. Yeah, <laughs> tell us more about it. Um, yes, yeah, so over the next couple of months, um, really our job is to pull together the high level implementation plan. I think anybody who reads at least the summary report will see there is a pretty good roadmap blueprint of the sorts of things that we need to do and some good guidance on how we might do some of the, meet some of the recommendations. What's really important first step is to actually make sure that we've mapped all of those things that we are already doing against the recommendations and you've already heard about some of those tonight like behavioural standards. Um, things like that can really accelerate some of the, the recommendations but there's also some things in here that we know will take a long time. Um, anything that relates to regulations there's a pathway towards that so we need to be starting to think about that now and what looks what that looks like in the plan um, and um, you know pull together a bit of a project team across the organisation, um, reporting through to the executive um, that says these are the pieces of work, um, but then it's about each and every recommendation, each additional um, activity we take. Um, and importantly, there will be some things in there that we don't have the resources today to do. Um, and that will be the sorts of things that in some cases we'll need to go to government to flag the intention for that, to secure the resources. Um, and that is really why it is a three to five year implementation plan. The next three months is really just the high level um, and then from there um, when we're working on individual things that's when consultation on particular things really starts mm. to happen um, with volunteers and staff across the board. So if our members read the report, um, have a, an idea or have some thoughts around what they read and, and want to contribute those, uh, those thoughts, how best can they feed that into the organisation? Oh, look, there's lots of ways. So you mentioned VFBV earlier. Um, so that's a really critical forum and mechanism for all of our volunteers. There's um, a number of uh, consultative forums that we've got one on the weekend um, and we'll be talking to that forum with representatives from all the, the districts on that um, that enables us to, to talk to them, get feedback through those mechanisms, um, obviously in their districts and, and through the regional structures. Um, you know, we talk, I talk regularly to the DCOs. Um, I'm paired with the, with the uh, North West region with Gavin Thompson. Um, so definitely get feedback around what's happening in that space and what um, brigades and volunteers in his area feel. And, you know, that's shared across um, the, all of the, the regions. So um, they're probably two of the key ones. I mean, even tonight, when we look at the chat and the questions that are coming through, that's feedback. We're hearing from members directly mm -hmm. about the things that they're interested in, because these are the people who are engaged, who are showing up, who are being part mm -hmm. of the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Some comments around, um, yeah, and thanks, Scott, for, for, for calling out. You know, don't forget the Inclusion Council too, Chief. So where do you see our uh, Diversity and Inclusion Councils yeah, look, fitting into this space? They're really important. Um, so our diversity and inclusion manager, Tasha Weir, um, has just started on a process of really refreshing our diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, I know that the diversity and inclusion ca um, councils are called out in the report as something that we're already doing and that we need to, to build on. So they'll be a key group to engage with around how we get that diversity into CFA in the future. And I think anybody um, who is invested in the future of CFA, which I think is pretty much all our members, um, understands that we need to recruit widely and broadly across our community. Otherwise, we won't be sitting here in 15 years time, 20 years time with the vibrant organisation that we have today. Absolutely. And it's great to see in the comments uh, a couple of members of the VFBV Joint Committee you know, offering their assistance to uh, mm. to provide you know, uh, input into pulling the, the implementation plan together. Uh, a really good question from John. Um, will there be more training and support to catchment teams, it includes you know, commanders and bassos, and these type of roles uh, in this process? In terms of, I'm assuming within the, you know, cultural change yep. moving Look, forward. I mean, I, I th think we'll come back to behavioural standards. That's a that's a really important piece, and we've started the rollout of that. Um, regional leadership teams, um, and that will start to flow flow through. Um, that certainly provides a, a foundation. Um, I think the volunteer um, leadership development space is something that is um, very live. Um, just came from a project control board meeting on that 
Um, today, where we've talked about and we'll be taking Tell forward to the executive in, yeah, a bit right. of an approach to begin to roll out more volunteer leadership um, that you know will be critical in in the regions and districts. Um, and our district support staff play a critical role in enabling that. Absolutely. Um, another question, a great question from Daniel. You know, what will be the future of the current Kato Kato Brigades and what will they look like uh, in the five-year plan? Uh, for me, you know, obviously, co-located stations are you know, current government policy around fire services reform, but I would have thought uh, you know, as we go and we embed behavioural standards, as we go to work on um, our cultural change, considering that uh, recommendation number nine mm. probably really goes to the heart of co-located brigades where every time we work with another uh, emergency service organisation, that being increasing that collaboration across Victorian fire services. So uh, has the panel got any thoughts on um, probably, yeah, Peter, from your perspective, Knox Group, um, yeah, you're very inter intertwined with FRB. Absolutely, um, yes. So what are you, what's your <coughs> thoughts on that question? Look, in integration, um, has, has worked well in some places. And I think uh, working together with our secondees is absolutely important to make all this, uh, this culture uh, work, work, make it work. Um, I, I don't see that there should be anything blocking anything like that from happening. Um, we've just got to, again, I refer back to the values of CFA, uh, the behavioural standards that we're now rolling out across the, the organisation, bring all that together and uh, we should have no problem working with any of our other agencies. Excellent, great, uh, great feedback there, um, Peter. Look, a couple of questions, there's some more questions in there. I am going to uh, move along a little bit. We are free to come back to uh, cultural reform, behavioural standards and the like, but I want to talk about another hot topic. And I know it's a hot topic because I get plenty of emails about this and that's the dreaded C word, COVID. <laughs> And the other word, vaccination. Um, Kylie, can you give us a, you know, health services sits again within your um, portfolio, mm -hmm. very big portfolio, important portfolio. Yes. What's the latest on the vaccination? So look, the latest is no change, essentially. So I know there's been a lot of talk in the media and you know things have be, been spreading, but um, at this point in time, there has been no change to the pandemic orders um, as it affects emergency services workers, paid or volunteer. So um, that is the, the status quo at the moment. We know it's a really important um, issue for members um, and it is something that we are behind the scenes and in you know, consultation with relevant others, trying to understand um, you know, if and when the pandemic orders are lifted, um, what that does mean and what the expectation from government is, um, and trying to understand what you know, other agencies are doing in this space, other volunteer organisations. Um, and we know that you know, there's plenty of advocacy to government about you know, understanding the challenges um, if we, you know, go one way or the other. So it is a complex space, but right here and now, um, there isn't any change and the work instructions and the standing orders are as, as yeah. they have been. And I guess for clarity for our members, uh, some would know that the current pandemic orders expire on the 12th, uh, and they've now been extended through the 24th right. uh, of this month. But can I rest assure uh, all members uh, we are hearing your concerns, uh, and we we are in we are in discussions at the moment uh, with government around what we can do uh, with those brigades, particularly those brigades uh, in rural settings that uh, you know, may not have the level of interactions as our more uh, active and urban brigades. About whether there is opportunity for us to do something different. Uh, very early stages. We are having those conversations. So. Uh, rest assured to, to our members, we, we have heard your concerns and we are working with government to try and come forward with a, with a way forward. But again, that's one that we're going to need to take uh, on a collective approach with, um, with the sector. But, uh, but I think, mm. Chief, one of the things we have heard, and it does link back to culture, is, you know, unfortunately, there are times when frustrations that people have with those mandates um, do boil over in interactions between with their colleagues and um, it's really important that we do remember that you know they're not uh, they're not abstract concepts they're you know these are the things that we can do um, to have positive culture in an organization and you know it's often said that culture is the way things are done around here and the way we want things to be done is all those do's on the behavioral standards um, and that we know it's difficult and understand that CFA is working to try and 
um, influence the decision makers. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and, and circling back, because we're, we're getting again some great questions on, um, I guess, the cultural view, but more the the, the so what uh, in terms of the implementation plan and some of the delivery of that. And um, and Robert raises around the issues of uh, you know, ACFOs and, and commanders and, you know, I would even say, you know, other leaders in the organisation, including our senior volunteer leaders, being empowered uh, and empowered to take action and deal with, um, deal with issues. And again, I think probably goes to the heart of recommendation five, uh, which was around, no, sorry, three, which was around enabling support um, to, to those people. Um, we, are, we do have a regulation review coming up soon. Yep. Uh, in 2024, I think we need mm. to have it uh, to government. And I know you and I have discussed previously how, uh, well, I guess you only need to read the, uh, the, the Act and regulations to probably appreciate that perhaps they're a little old fashion considering the chief is only ever referred to as a he yeah <laughs> um so but but it is very much on our mind isn't it about yeah, delegations empowering yeah absolutely so um it it you know it was certainly clear to me coming into the cfa that the regulations that the cfa currently is required to sort of operate under a very very uh laborious cumbersome and frankly old-fashioned um, and they do need to be modernised. There's no question about that. Without losing the essence of what um, CFA is and the command structures and those sorts of things where, where appropriate, but the disciplinary regulations in particular are very old-fashioned and, and ultimately lead to an adversarial environment rather than a resolution-focused environment, and, and that will have to change. In the meantime, we have to follow those regulations. They are the regulations. That is the law of the land. But we do want to make sure that we're... Um, preparing now and we will use this review to do that work um, to put our case forward for how we want to see the regulations change. Ultimately it is a matter for government but um, we, one of the reasons that we've you know, taken the time to do this review well is taking the government along the journey with us um, and it's certainly a recommendation in the review that the regulations be looked at and modernised and we think that that will help in dealing with a number of the issues that do cause frustration now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, another, uh, uh, I guess, comment here and um, there are some fans out there um, for the board members, uh, Dawn oh, and Peter. Alex, you've got so quite the fan cool. club I see. Uh, That's a given. Shout outs <laughs> from Mount Cottrell Group. Um, Helen Zoke, and Alan and Clark Consulting, obviously, that did the report, called out specifically the need for senior leadership to be visible. Mm. And in fact, called out board members mm. to be in the, with the need to be visible. Um, your thoughts? It's absolutely <laughs> critical, not only to uh, us to be able to take a message to uh, uh, the membership out there of the organisation, but it gives us the feedback from what's mm. going on out there in the real world. It's all right, Dawn might be a captain and I might be a group officer but we're isolated to our particular area for that knowledge. Mm. Mm. So um, I know Dawn and I both get regularly get to uh, brigade dinners and other events, um, and it's more about, or as much about, getting that feedback from those people to feed our knowledge of CFA beyond our own little group or brigade. Yep. Mm. Um, that's probably the critical part of that and uh, would absolutely support us getting out there as often as we can. Mm. Dawn? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's critical. Um, if, if you're not prepared to kind of be on the ground and, and actually be amongst um, the incredible people who constantly astound me that they give up so much free time to do what they do, um, this is the best part of the job. And I, I've said it um, time and time again at events. The best part of the job is actually being on the ground, attending events, attending functions, and seeing the faces and that are with the names. And, you know, with we talk about 55,000 strong but those are 55,000 people and families. So to actually get to have that connection, there's nothing better. Mm. And I can assure you that going to those events too, we get feedback, yep. yes. absolute feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, so I, I guess a, a nice little analogy, and I, I know I had a conversation with a, with a journalist on, on this matter as well, but yeah, when you start to put our membership, the size and quantum of our membership yep. in a bit of perspective, yeah, 54,000 people, we're talking about you know, essentially the size of Mildura, our large regional um, city in terms of a population. And, and how I describe it to, to, to people is even Mildura has a police service uh, for <laughs> obvious reasons. So, um, you know, I think it's really, it's not about 
doing this report, doing the plan, implementing the plan, and then magically overnight all our problems will disappear. No. Is it? Like it's, right. it, it's a journey that we're going to have to continue being on, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and again, another part of us getting out there as much as we can is to try and push that message. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so again, another, uh, another hard question. Um, and I've been joined back by <laughs> our uh, catchment commander, Alex. Welcome back um, to the panel. And I'll ask you back because I want to have a, uh, an interesting conversation and maybe a difficult conversation. Yep. Um, and you probably know where I'm going. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm listening and I'm here. Um, the shirt, mate. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, questions asked, so, hey panel, if we are now CFA and moving forward, as Natalie has said, why aren't employees seconded, et cetera, wearing CFA uniforms? Uh, that we are now, you know, so that we feel like that we're, we're CFA. Yep. Uh, you wear the uniform. Yep. You're one of the people that yep. are out there with uh, with our members, yep. um, hearing things like that, yep. how does that affect you? Uh, immensely, I think, because um, it's an identity issue. And, um, you know, I think um, people who work for this organisation love this organisation, but there are some things that are outside of people's control. Uh, I think that um, the decision uh, or the power that people have to make a change in that space doesn't sit with the people who necessarily uh, have to wear the uniform. But I think, you know, ultimately it's about respecting the individual and, mm. and the work that they do, mm. not necessarily the shirt that they're wearing. Mm. I mean, we all make a contribution to CFA and we're here because we want to be here. So uh, I hope that um, people understand that uh, irrespective of the uniform that they're wearing, uh, we're all here for the right reason, mm. and that's to support each other. Because uh, for you, that's the reality. You, mm. you don't have a choice. That's right. Um, I, I can't change it for you as mm. much as many of our seconded staff would like that to be. Mm. It, you know, it is part of your uh, enterprise agreement, federal mm. instrument. It, it's, you know, it is law, mm. I guess. You know, and that we touched on before, law of the land. Mm. Um, but I, uh, I think it's, it's something that all everyone appreciates, would, you know, would like to see that, but it mm. has a personal toll on... Yeah. On individuals yeah. that, you know, such as yourself, that have to you know, to wear that uniform, yeah. and yeah, and I think the, the crux of it is though that it shouldn't matter whether Alex Batty wants to wear an FRV shirt or he wants to wear a CFA shirt. I, I mean, I, my message to people is focus on the job that we're doing uh, and the way that we're all contributing to to this space, and we, we've got to kind of move move beyond that. Yeah, because ladies and gentlemen, here's the reality: on the first of July, twenty twenty. It's the same great chocolate, just in a different wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> so moving, uh, moving along to, uh, to on our agenda here, a couple of things. We did want to give a couple of updates as well. We, we have been having a pretty um, in-depth conversation. We've talked about some, some serious issues as well. And again, if anyone is uh, upset or disturbed by the conversation this evening, please reach out. Uh, to member services, they are waiting for your call. Um, but I did want to touch on a couple of other things. Uh, as usual, Danny Jones, thank you for answering the multitude of infrastructure and truck related <laughs> questions uh, and workwear questions. Um, uh, there's been many of those and I, I thank you for, for taking those online. Likewise, um, other, um, other executive on the line as well that have been answering uh, some of the questions. Uh, another shout out, I gotta say, and, and uh, this gentleman is online this evening, and I know some people have already caught on to that uh, in the chat, and that is uh, congratulations to, to Ross Coyle, uh, who mm. has been mm. uh, appointed as a, as a new member to the CFA board. Doesn't start straight away, but will we'll join us uh, a little bit later. So Ross, you're online. Thank you very much for watching and congratulations uh, for, your uh, for your appointment. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to having you in the boardroom. Uh, discussing yep. the uh, discussing the important uh, the important um, uh, issues of the day. So a couple of a uh, couple of things to catch up on. Um, some of you may be aware that we have been talk dealing with some um, or talking about some of the challenges of when we've got so many different vehicle types. Um, mm. We've got so many so many different brigades uh, moving around the state, particularly during. Uh, summer campaigns uh, and having interstate fire crews come into into this um, uh, into Victoria, uh, we do have quite a lot of vehicle typology. Um, yes, some some very 
uh, you know, the threes and fours and twos yeah. and A, B, Cs and Ds. <laughs> uh, and one of the things that I guess we learnt from doing an ICAM investigation was the importance of people knowing how to use some of these mm. uh, appliances. And Peter, um, we did a little project recently with we did. Knox yep. Group. Yep. Uh, and thank you for, for Knox Group for pulling this together. Um, and we're just about to play uh, a video uh, here now. And uh, what the idea is that um, on the inside cab of each of these vehicles, there'll be a QR code uh, that people will be able to go to if you've never operated the vehicle before or you've been allocated this vehicle on a, on a strike team or the like, that you can scan that code and effectively get an introduction to the vehicle, but more importantly, the safety features uh, of that vehicle. And uh, you were there on the day of filming, Peter. Take us through, I guess, some of the things that we went through. Okay, so we tried to get a, uh, a situation where we covered primarily the, the major uh, components of the, of the different trucks that we filmed. We did six on the, on the two days, but we tried to cover the safety features as much as anything. How to engage the pump, how to get the ladder off the truck, uh, where the main safety gear is, the D-fib and the, and the first aid gear is kept on those individual types of vehicles. Um, we also covered the uh, uh, sprays for, for, for protection of, the, of the, the members that might be caught, if they're caught in that bad situation that haven't been on that truck before. It's not a training video. It's just really there about the, giving the basic components of the vehicle so that you can take over that vehicle. I would expect that you would still take the vehicle for drive, You'd go around the vehicle before you went anywhere with it and just have a closer look at what's in the lockers and the more detailed stuff that's not picked up in the video. Uh, and familiarise yourself with the vehicle separately as well. But this gives you the good head start. Mm. Absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the key uh, things that we did want to do is make sure that people were aware of the, the key safety features. Absolutely. So yep. you know, activating crew protection sprays, knowing um, you know, how to deploy curtains and... Uh, I guess for some of our pumpers, knowing how to engage the pump, if it's you know, a light pumper to a medium pumper, uh, manual transmission through to automatic transmission. Um, it is quite confusing for people that, you know, firefighters coming from another state or territory, you know, they're experienced firefighters. You know, they know what they're doing, but when you get a vehicle that's uh, um, you know, foreign to you and it's in its configuration, and I think about 1920 uh, and the number of volunteers you know, deployed to New South Wales and mm. I'm sure many of them are working were working on vehicles that they weren't familiar with either yeah so, um, yeah it's, it's it's yeah so we didn't try and, and teach people how to use the equipment mm. in this it was about where the equipment was and how to turn it on or how to operate it uh, from the from the vehicle perspective rather than trying to teach them how to uh, roll hose and bowl hose and how to put a branch on. It wasn't about any of that. It was just about the idiosyncrasies of each individual truck. That if you knew your firemanship, you could, you could take the truck from there and, and work with what it had. Um, Alex, from an operations perspective? Yeah, we were just talking about this before. I, I, mean, I think the, the, the bounds of this are endless. I mean, mm. and I think in particular, you talk about um, we didn't use it in the training space, but I, I imagine, you know, with people learning with different styles mm. uh, and not necessarily picking up something straight away, even with FGPs, for example, mm. you could potentially have those ready to go for people who wanted to go down to the fire station outside of the training environment, scan a barcode, mm. a, and then have the video on hand straight away. Uh, I, I think it's magnificent. Mm. There's, there's a lot more to be seeing in this, I'm sure. Mm. Absolutely. Um, another, uh, and I don't want to take away because it is an important um, topic. So I, I, I do, you know, I probably will come back to the main features tonight around culture and uh, and the report and the like. And it's been a really great question again from Brendan. Um, the discipline procedure precludes volunteers from being represented at any stage. All employees retain the right to representation by their industrial agreements. You know, equity question, natural justice question. Um, whilst um, that's probably not technically the case uh, if you're dealing with the uh, discipline process uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it is, but it does go to, I think, an important question, and that is how do you ensure natural justice and procedural fairness uh, in the conduct of a hearing or a, a complaints process? And I know, Natalie, we've been talking about, about that. What's your thoughts on how we might be able to yeah, improve things in that space. Yeah, well, there's no question that we, you know, we need to improve things, I think, in that space. Just, um, you know, if you take the after action review process and look at some of the things that we've been trying to work through, particularly some of the more complex things, that um, there has to be a better way than what we've got. I think there are some discussions 
that we want to have with the VFVV on this front and even within the boundaries of the regulations that we have now, um, we've got some ideas about how we can make that process um, less onerous um, and, um, and fairer uh, without having everybody have lawyers at 80 paces or five paces or two paces. That is not in anyone's mm. best interest, you know, um, unless it's a very extreme case and then, you, you know, it, it will be what it will be. So I, I think it is very much on our minds about how to, um, again, within the boundaries of what we can do within the regulations, try to um, modernise and, and make this process one which we can um, ensure happens quickly, doesn't get bogged down um, and can be worked through. But, you know, I guess watch this space is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. It's a great question um, and it is something that we we are um, turning our minds to about what we can do to try and make make this a, a better process for all concerned. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, probably the, the last question for you, for you mm -hmm. tonight, but um, uh, is there any work, or I'm, I'm probably more important than uh, yeah, wanting your thoughts on um, communication and consistent messaging between state, through to brigades, through region uh, and the like? Yeah, I, I actually think we live in the space of uh, there's almost communication overload. Uh, so, so I think, you know, if there's something that we need to strive for into the future is about streamlining that. Uh, I think uh, we need to make sure that the message is clear. Uh, sometimes uh, people, uh, I think, are receiving messages from many different places and, and, and many people who have been CFA for a long time will understand the old uh, rumour and grapevine. But we need to break through that. So, so anything we can do to provide clear and consistent messages uh, from state back down into the districts and then, in, of course, uh, to, to the brigades uh, is, is where we need to be, yeah. Awesome. Plenty of questions about uh, the video that we played in terms of uh, the induction videos for the appliances. They will be available uh, externally uh, uh, via the, the, the internet, uh, so you won't necessarily need members online, but I'm sure they will be available on members online. And naturally, uh, if you scan the QR code when they are put into the trucks, uh, you'll be able to see them um, too. Tonight, you've been given an exclusive sneak peek uh, and the production team are still madly finishing, uh, you know, pulling together all the other, other videos. So uh, as soon as they are ready to go, uh, I'm sure Katarina and the crew from the Lessons Management Centre uh, will be knocking up safety shares uh, and the like and you'll be seeing it in an operation, a quarterly operational update coming to you uh, soon. Uh, one last update I wanted to, to give everyone uh, this evening was, uh, Natalie, in the mid-year uh, aspect and, and towards the end of the year, we gave members a bit of a, uh, an update on some of the investments that we made into, uh, into brigades, whether that be the battery-powered um, yeah, ram fans or the Milwaukee tool sets, the liking gear, yep. TIGs, Kestrels, um, you name it. Um, we pretty much tried to give yep. as many brigades and you know groups and the like something uh, as humanly possible. Well, I'm happy to uh, let you all know that uh, the State Logistics Centre is madly receiving trucks uh, daily. Uh, and here's some pictures of all the gear starting to arrive. In fact, uh, the crew are already starting to put together uh, the cutting bag and the drilling bag for those that uh, are going to be put on uh, on the pumpers across the state. So uh, all that fantastic gear is starting to arrive into the SLC and we'll be uh, working with, uh, with logistics and our districts to uh, let you know when that's going to be coming forward uh, to your brigades. But I think it's a, a fantastic um, way that yes, mm. CFA as an organisation can show its appreciation for, for its volunteers. And then if we did have uh, a few bucks lying around it to you know, really work with our volunteers and put some gear back in yeah, uh, back into I think appliances. that's um, I, I think that's something we, you know, well, I think we're both really pleased mm. about through the course of this year that where we've been able to identify genuine savings, we're kind of harvesting those. That's the right word <laughs> early, um, so that we are able to make those investments in equipment that we know our brigades um, want and in many cases need and provide additional capability. So. It's something that you'll see us continue to do as, as we move forward, where we're able to make those investments um, uh, from time to time that can, can make the work of the brigade safer, easier, more efficient, more effective. Very important. Work. Absolutely. And, and so, Alex, what, what would it mean for your brigades in uh, Mount Cottrell? Uh, look, I, I think they'll be wrapped. Uh, I, I mean, you know, the, the, those brigades in particular out in the West are doing more and more work and we're asking more and more of our volunteers every single day and, and any form of equipment that we can do to help people have a better outcome is going to be received well. So I'm, I'm sure they'll be absolutely uh, stoked.
Excellent. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that time has come yet again where we must part ways. Uh, and that concludes uh, our volunteer forum for this evening. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Peter Shaw, uh, Natalie McDonald, Dawn Hartog, Alex Batty and Kylie Bates uh, for coming along uh, and joining the panel this evening, contributing uh, to the discussion. But before I leave, uh, again, as always, behind the cameras, there is a team of people from our corporate <laughs> communications uh, uh, staff that come together um, and make this all happen for us. So a massive shout out uh, to, to you all. You all know who you are and they're all looking at me very nervously. <laughs> um, you do a fantastic job every month. You've made this happen. Uh, likewise, yeah, this is the second volunteer forum we've done on the new platform. Uh, and again, we seek your feedback uh, in terms of how you are finding it. Uh, they do a fantastic job and uh, on behalf of, of Natalie, myself and the executive, we thank you very much for your commitment uh, to pulling this all together every month. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that concludes this evening. Stay safe and uh, we'll see you at next month's Volunteer Forum.